Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He has passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting is excluded. But what kind of law? By a law of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to Him in prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, we come to you dependently asking that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm just curious uh, if... Uh, those of you have been, over the last uh, week or two, been watching sports that you never watch any other time except every four years in watching the Olympic sports. Just, just curious how many... Yeah. So, I, I, I have to say, grow, growing up an athlete, um, and I love sports, and I'm not a big TV watcher until there's a sport that I really like. Uh, or as uh, my daughter and, and son-in-law, who both were collegiate swimmers, say, is that every four years is the only time that the nation watches swimming. But we watch it, and it's been wonderful, and I've been so excited uh, about all the different sports and, and the sports that are coming uh, in, the, in the week to come. But there was something that was said the other day by one of the commentators, and uh, he said that it is for gold and glory. And I began to think about that, and I, I understand that. I, I have secretly sometimes, well, maybe often, thought about what it would be like if I stood on the podium and got the gold medal. Uh, do you think I'd cry? <laughs> I weep like a baby, right? The national anthem, and I'm just going, you know, I, I, I cry when I watch them. And so, <laughs> uh, but the thought of, of, of gold and, and, and glory, and I, and I begin to think about that. You know, there is something innately in us that desires glory. And I'm not talking necessarily about self-promotion, but there really is something within us as humans. We desire, in fact I would argue Paul even points to this in Romans chapter 2, we desire glory as human beings. Well, the shorter catechism eloquently describes God's work of creation this way. God's making all things of nothing by the word of His power in the space of six days and all very good. In other words, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were created by God. But that does not mean that everything was created equally good. Of all that God created in the beginning, it was only of man that God said these words. Let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness. Only man was created in the image of God. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And they were created, as we subscribe, in knowledge. They were created in righteousness. They were created in perfect holiness. Perfectly revealing the glory of God. Now, though this is true, it is hard to fathom, isn't it? And while we may say, for golden glory, and while we may think the, the glory in that moment of that sporting event, when all of a sudden we're talking about God's glory, well, it's kind of hard to think about, isn't it? We may think of glory, but do we typically think of mankind? Do you think of your neighbor as revealing God's glory? It's far easier to sing with the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Or, as Elizabeth Bennett, that character of Jane Austen's novel said, what are men to rocks and mountains? And yet, it is neither the heavens above nor the firmament below that bear God's image. It's only man that bears God's image. And the reason that I think that it's hard for us to fathom is because when we think of God's glory, we like, likely think of God's supreme gravitas. He is glorious. While us, well, compared to Him, we're seemingly glory-less. But the distinction is more than merely the difference between the Creator and the created. The fall of man into sin severely and substantially impacted all of mankind as image-bearing, glory-revealing beings. And it's a, it's a truth consistently revealed. Well, it's consistently revealed through our depravity. Therefore, when Paul describes the evidence of the fallen human depravity, he describes it in three Words He says that it's revealed in, in mankind. Well, I've lost my place. Here it is. It's revealed in mankind as suppressing the truth, dishonoring God, and exchanging the glory of God by exchanging the glory of the immortal God. The three words that I want you to remember there are suppressing, dishonoring, and exchanging, which describes the human condition. Yet, we want glory, don't we? In fact, we even long for it, whether we know it or not. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, that the human heart seeks after the restoration of glory, honor, and immortality. The reality of our current condition is far different, however, isn't it? All, all, Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the light of God's glory among those created in the image of God, none is righteous. The prophet says, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. No one does good. How many? Nope, not even one. But this is not the final word for sinners like you and like me. Paul doesn't leave us to wallow in the knowledge of our sinful state nor the evidence of it, but points us to God's glory in the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, consider this glorious truth of God's mercy and grace. I asked it in Sunday school this morning. What is God's mercy? Well, in God's mercy, He does not give us what we deserve. And we deserve judgment. And I asked this morning, what is God's grace? God's grace, in God's grace, He gives us what we don't deserve. 
That is salvation. And we receive God's mercy and grace through the means of faith. Or as we say, we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Although contrary to how we typically think of faith, saving faith is not something that we produce, is it? We think of that, it's my faith. Well, or or is it? Scripture says that our saving faith is actually a gift that God gives us. Paul makes this clear in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is through this gift of faith that we are justified as righteous before God. And, let me add, that it is this perspective that will bless your life immensely. What I mean by that is, is that if you believe that you decided to believe, that it's your choice to choose God or to reject Him, you become the focus. But if you say, God, why me? Why did you save a wretch like me? That you even bestowed your grace upon me and gave me the gift of faith. The emphasis becomes what? God. And His grace. His glory. And will change your perspective as a Christian in acknowledging that everything is from the Lord. But when you realize this, and take your eyes off of yourself and put it upon God, we also need to acknowledge that it's not just faith in and of itself, is it? It's not just the gift of faith, but it is the object of that gift. And what is the object of our faith? As Paul put it in 1 Corinthians, he said, It is simply Christ and Him crucified. But why crucified? Why did Paul say that we, our faith is in Christ and Him crucified? crucified. I mean, think about it this way. Why is it not Christ the good teacher? I believe in Jesus. He was an amazing teacher of truth. Or why is it not the Jesus that was the role model? I believe in Jesus. He was such a good role model as a leader, as a, as a person, as a man. Or why is it not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a moral man? He was remarkably moral, was he not? But the answer to this in our passage, is found in the word redemption. It is a key word that we must understand as Christians. We are justified by God's grace as a gift, as Paul says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption literally means to buy back. And it's a financial used here and as elsewhere to describe a purchase from slavery. To understand this term, I want you to remember back to the prologue to the Ten Commandments. How does the Ten Commandments begin? It doesn't begin with the first commandment, does it? The Ten Commandments begin with a prologue in which God says to Israel... I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The indicative of who God is and what He has done precedes the imperative of His commands. In other words, God makes the statement, that is an indicative, He actually makes two statements, doesn't He? The two indicatives, He says, I am the Lord your God. He reveals Himself to His people first. Secondly, God then tells them what He has done. I am the Lord your God, and I redeemed you from the house of slavery. And then, thirdly, He gives them the imperative, the commands for living unto Him. But there is more to this word, redemption, that we must understand. 
Because it includes not only a statement or indicative of truth, but also a payment. The payment of our redemption. The transaction that secured our redemption. To illustrate this point, again, I want you to think back to Israel, but this time I want you to think back to the Passover. Specifically, in the slaughtered life and shed blood of the Lamb. It was not by uprising force that Israel was freed from Egypt, was it? No, it was by the act of God. It was not by their merit that they were saved from the angel of death, was it? No, they were saved by the shed blood of the Lamb upon the doorpost. It was the Lamb who was the center point of the Passover meal. But the key here is, and especially as we are to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning as a church, why? Why was the slaughtered Lamb and shed blood the center point of the Passover meal? Because the Lamb pointed to something greater. The blood pointed to something greater. It pointed to redemption from slavery to sin. And Paul puts it this way in our passage. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. The word propitiation there means atoning death. That's the key. To put it another way, we have been saved by God because we have been served redemptively by Christ. We have been served by Christ. As I said, the word propitiation translated, or or, or another translation could be the atoning sacrifice. Rightly then, think back with me to the early part of Jesus' ministry, Trivia question, I suppose, this morning is how did John the Baptist address Jesus when Jesus came to him? Do you remember what he said? John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in his righteous life, he was the Lamb without blemish, he was the Lamb without spot. And it was His precious blood that atoned for sin. He was the perfect sacrifice. And therefore, John could refer to Him as the Lamb of God. The writer of Hebrews, as Greg read earlier, the writer of Hebrews explains this this way. He writes, "...since therefore the children share in flesh and blood..." He himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so through Christ's service, we, His propitiatory service, we are saved. What are we saved from? We are saved from God's judgment, God's wrath. Precisely because why? Because Christ's atoning sacrifice satisfied the perfect righteousness of God. God is indeed just. And His justice was preserved in Christ's atoning sacrifice. And so when Paul says in our passage before us, when he says this was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins, he does not mean that God dismisses sin without cause Or without cost. You see, your sin and my sin is an offense to a holy God. Justice is due. In fact, justice is demanded. And the cross of Christ satisfies the righteousness of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son in literal time and space. To be made sin 
so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That great exchange. And therefore, we have now been, as Paul says, justified by His blood. Preserving God's justice and also justifying sinners through faith. That's why Paul in our passage says that God is just, but He is also the justifier. Justice must be served, and Christ served it. But not everyone is justified as righteous, are they? Only those who by God's grace believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are saved. From God's wrath. We are the only ones who are justified as righteous by God's grace through faith. And so we are saved through faith. And this applies, as Paul points out, for Gentile and Jew alike. And to be clear, salvation is not, nor ever was, under any kind of dispensation of history. By obedience to the law. Whether written on tablets of stone or written on the human heart, salvation was never through the law. None but one perfectly kept the law. None but one fulfilled it. None but one can boast. None but one is worthy of worship. And so we look by faith to none but one. Jesus Christ, the righteous We are saved not by the law of works, but as Paul puts it here, by the law of faith. A play on words directing us to the means of our salvation. So where does this put us? Where does this put us who innately desire glory and yet so clearly see that we who are made in the image of God have fallen from grace? Those saved not by works, but we are saved by God's grace through faith. It puts us in a position, and that's why Paul brings up boasting here. It puts us in a position not of self-exalting glory, but God-glorifying praise. Think about that just a second. For gold and glory... I want the glory. No. God is worthy of the glory. And He redeems us that we may glorify Him. I love, and you know this as the church, I love that first catechism question of the shorter catechism. What is the chief end of man? We could quote it together, couldn't we? Well, let's do. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Yes, for this we were created in God's image. For this we were redeemed in Christ. For what? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's the true meaning of glory. That's the eternal significance of Of glory. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us rejoice in this truth. Though we fall so very short of God's glory, we are saved by His grace to glorify Him forever. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we ask for your forgiveness as so often we look to ourselves. Glory in our abilities and our works as if somehow our sinful merits would please a holy God. And yet, you are so gracious to us, so merciful, not giving us what we deserve, giving us what we do not deserve. You have saved us by your grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for his perfect life. We thank you for His atoning death. 
We thank you for his victorious resurrection and we celebrate that he has ascended and seated to your right hand, even interceding for us in this very moment as we come together as a church to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. God, we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to worship you in this sacrament. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.